Today's talk is titled, Letting Go, to be delivered by Andy Fagan. Andy Fagan began his UU journey in 2008 back in Huntington, New York. Shortly after discovering Cambria and the UUCC, he joined this congregation in 2010. He's finishing up his three-year term as vice president on the board of trustees this year. As many of you have heard, Andy has been on the verge of retirement for several years, and he promises that he is getting closer and closer to letting go of his almost 50 year career as a stage manager. He looks forward to spending more time with friends and family in the future. Andy. Thank you, Nancy. Hi, everybody. It's good to be back. I've been away a, almost an mo entire month. So if you're fortunate, uh, fortunate to have a long life on this earth, then you'll be inevitably faced with the challenges of letting go. But the good news is, as Thich Nhat Hanh said in our opening words, letting go gives us freedom. And freedom is the only condition for happiness. If in our heart, we still cling to anything, anger, anxiety, or possessions, we cannot be free. Anyone who has had a decent conversation with me knows that I've been wrapped up in the process of letting go, letting go of many things, letting go of my New York identity, letting go of a career, letting go of loved ones whose time on this earth has come to an end, and letting go of some beliefs or convictions that put limitations on what I can do and who I am. I've sought and longed for guidance on how to cope with letting go. That search is a big part of what brought me to Unitarian Universalism. And this morning, I'm going to share some of the things I've found so far. I do not come to you this morning as someone who has any of the answers, but as a kindred spirit in the exploration of the mystery. And so let's begin with one of the most meaningful resources I have found. That is the words of John O'Donohue. This from his book, To Bless the Space Between Us. Sometimes the greatest challenge is to actually begin. There is something deep in us that conjures, that conspires with what wants to remain within safe boundaries and stay the same. Years ago, my neighbor set out to build his new home. He had just stripped the sod off the field to begin digging out the foundation when an old man from the village happened to come by. He blessed the work and said, you have the worst of it behind you now. My neighbor laughed and said, but I've only just begun. The old man said, that's what I mean, you have begun. And to make a real beginning is the most difficult act. There's an old Irish proverb that says, a good beginning is half the work. There seems to be a wisdom here when one considers all the considerations, hesitation and uncertainty that can claim our hearts for such a long time before the actual act of beginning happens. Sometimes a period of preparation is necessary where the idea of the beginning can gestate and refine itself. Yet quite often, we unnecessarily postpone and equivocate when we should simply take the risk and leap into a new beginning. In preparing for this talk on letting go, I reached, I searched O'Donohue's book of blessings only to realize that letting go and new beginnings are one and the same. As always, he shed light on a mystery I am exploring. Another book I'm learning from is titled 4,000 Weeks. 
I was introduced to it during an on being discussion Krista Tippett had with its author, Oliver Berkman. It helped me to reframe some basic concepts of my life. As the cover states, the book is about time management for mortals. Time, our way of measuring the duration of existence. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines time as a non-spatial continuum in which events occur in apparently irreversible succession from the past through the present to the future. It's that irreversible succession that ties time into my discussion of letting go. The title of the book comes from a simple equation. What's this? Well, with approximately 50 weeks in a year and a reasonable life expectancy of 80 years, apologies to those of you who are well beyond 80, you are all amazing. You can roughly plan on living 4,000 weeks. The author chooses weeks because it's a period of time, well, we understand pretty easily, and 4,000 is a number that we can easily grasp. If, they, if we did days, it would be like 60,000, and years is just 80-ish. As I learn more about letting go and accepting that life will come to an end, I found this simple equation helpful. In a summary of the book, a reviewer stated, we are deluged with advice on becoming more productive and efficient and life hacks to optimize our days. But such techniques often end up making things worse. The sense of anxious hurry grows more intense, and yet the most meaningful parts of life seem to lie just beyond the horizon. Still, we rarely make the connection between our daily struggles with them and the ultimate time management problem, the challenge of how best to use our 4,000 weeks. I didn't get to announce my birthday um, last Sunday, but it was November 4th, and I just turned 70. So I've lived 3,640 weeks, and I can bank, give or take, on 360 more. Yikes. Uh, but instead of freaking out about that, it has brought me to make life decisions based on that number. I can do a lot with 360 weeks, but I don't want to waste any of them. I want to make the most of each of them, and at the same time, let go of each of them as they have passed. And in that light, letting go of my career becomes that much more attractive, since I know about myself that I can't find the energy and focus to tackle the list of things I want to do while work is drawing that energy and focus away from them. And the book suggests I am working on living each day as fully as I can, as the book suggests, savoring each hour, and then letting go of that day. Deepak Chopra recommends a practice. Before going to sleep at night, have a moment of appreciation for the day. What, what happened during it? What was wonderful? And what could have been better? Let go of each day once it has ended, but cherish what life you've lived. The book asks, quote, what would it mean to spend the only time you ever get in a way that truly feels as though you are making it count? And the author suggests that remembering how little you matter on a cosmic scale can feel like putting down a heavy burden that most of us didn't realize we were carrying in the first place. By remembering how little you matter. Overvaluing of your existence gives rise to an unrealistic definition of what it would mean to use your finite time well. 
Hmm. And perhaps by understanding our own timeline, we can let go of the unrealistic pressures society puts on us and live a more enlightened life. My father died in June of 2001, just shy of the age of 80, so he got 4,620 weeks. His was a sudden and unexpected passing. My mother was deeply devoted to my dad and deeply in love with him. She lived almost 20 more years to the age of 96. She got 4,995 weeks, but was never able to accept losing him, letting go. She did not want grief counseling or therapy of any kind. I tried my best to offer what guidance I could, but nothing seemed to help much. As her dementia progressed in her last years, I would often find her sitting in a darkened room in the middle of the day, and I'd ask her what she was doing. She would calmly answer, I was talking with dad, to the end of her life, she struggled to let go. With dad's passing, followed two months later by the horrifying events of 9-11, I found myself, as so many of us did, in a dark place, searching for answers. That began a quest that eventually led me to Unitarian Universalism, which at the suggestion of a beloved minister led me to a book titled From Aging to Saging, A Revolutionary Approach to Growing Older. Anybody read that book? Okay, put it, in, put it on your list, it's a good one. The authors of From Aging to Saging start by urging us to reframe our later years. They write, the more we embrace our mortality not as an aberration of nature, but as an agent urging us on to life completion, the more our anxiety transforms into a feelings of awe, thanksgiving, and appreciation. When we de-repress, that is, stop repressing the fear of death, we reclaim the energy that has gone into denial. We feel buoyed up as streams of creative energy course through our bodies, minds, and nervous systems. By facing a subject that usually depresses and terrifies us, we feel lighter, freer, more perceptually and cognitively alive in all our encounters. Or, as Mary Oliver says in her poetic words, every year, Everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things, to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it, and when the time comes to let it go, let it go. Letting go of my career as a stage manager, which has been rewarding in so many ways and defined much of who I am, has been difficult. Since 1975, I have been incredibly fortunate to make my living doing what I love. In accepting a Lifetime Achievement Award one year ago, I wrote, the art and craft of stage management has always been for me a higher calling. I consider myself so fortunate to have found a career that I could be passionate about. We stage managers strive to build an environment which nurtures creativity. When we do our best work, we free artists to work their magic in their performances, their designs, their constructions, their words, their vision. I love the hallowed halls in which we are privileged to make our livings. I love the technology, old and new. 
I love the audiences and the attendees, their laughter, their tears, the moments when we expand their horizons and the moments when we take their breath away. I love stage management. It is what you, if it is what you are meant to do and you are fortunate, as fortunate as I have been, then it is indeed a lifetime to cherish. Aging to Saging is helping me through the process of letting go of this career. In it, I read, what we can learn from the Hindu notion of the four ashramas is to rethink retirement as a spiritual vocation that we prepare for in middle age by cultivating a contemplative outlook. When we contemplate our lives, we place ourselves in a vast continuum of time that takes into account the remote past, the present, and the unfolding future. With such an outlook, we discern patterns of meaning and purpose that might otherwise escape us when our gaze is restricted to the merely momentary occurrences of day-to-day -day living. If we begin practicing a contemplative discipline in middle age, we can keep the big picture before our mind's eye as we move into the afternoon of our days. We also can receive nourishment and support from the deeper levels of our being as we gradually begin detaching from our social and professional identities. By doing our inner homework when we are younger, we won't feel so disoriented when the, other, when the outer props are removed in retirement. We will have practical skills to begin shifting our identity from the smaller self which is concerned with personal, personal survival and well being, to the larger self, which is concerned with the universal and well being of the planet and the multitude of species it sustains. The book goes on with a quote from historian and philosopher Thomas Kuhn As risk takers, who can heal and humanize society? Elders have five appropriate roles to play. They are mentors who teach the young, mediators who resolve civil, racial, and intergenerational conflict, monitors of public bodies who serve as watchdogs of City Hall and Congress, mobilizers of social change, and motivators of society who urge people away from self-interest and toward the public good. These are high aspirations. The book calls this new occupation spiritual eldering, which can be a topic for a future talk. I'll just say that as mentors who teach the young, the first thing we should teach them is that, unlike me, they read this book while they're still young in order to be better prepared for their later years. Let's see, oh, it's just a minute. Okay, okay. Now for part two. <laughs> Hi, Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Ah, <laughs> uh, where was I? Okay, uh, with the conclusion of a recent annual corporate event that I have stage managed for many years, I spoke directly to the client to say that this would be my last one. That was brave, it took a little courage. I know, I know. Um, that I was approaching retirement. She was shocked and immediately asked, what will you do? Truth is, I have a long list of things I plan to do in my retirement, but I don't have my elevator speech prepared, so I was at a loss for a good answer. Notwithstanding the lack of a succinct response, I have come to accept that I am ready to take the plunge. To repeat what Pema Chodron says, you may feel that you're going to die or that something is going to die, and you will be right. If you let go, something, something will die. But it's something that needs to die and you will benefit greatly from its death.
turn, turn, turn. A few weeks ago, my dear friend Judy Butler shared a chart that made us consider the thousands of ancestors we have as we look back through the generations of our ancestors, of our ancestors, of our ancestors. I'm now working to consider the mirror image of that. Those who we will touch into the future. We may only get 4,000 weeks, but there is the legacy of what we do with those weeks. If we consider the offspring of our offsprings, offsprings, offspring, the students of our students, 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 the loves of the loves of the ones we've loved, all who might share some of that spiritual eldering with us, we are meant to do, then letting go is something we can live with. Thank you for listening.